Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today I'd like to do a modeling example of a multi-degree of freedom system using Lagrange's equations, and this is for fundamentals of mechanical vibrations. Here's the problem I'd like to look at. I have two masses. One block has mass m1, the second has mass m2, and they are chained together with springs, spring constant k1, k2, and k3. I would like to find the equations of motion for this system. So if I look, the first thing we'll do is, is again, kind of follow this procedure that we've developed. We'll think about the system. We'll identify the objects. We'll determine what forces are conservative, what forces are constraint forces, what forces are not conservative. We will define coordinates and directions. Then we'll go through and identify the kinetic energy, followed by the potential energy, and then the application of Lagrange's equations. So to start off with, we will think about the system. So again, I'd like to get a sense of how the system moves <coughs> and the objects as well as what forces act on those objects. So here, this is a two degree of freedom system. It has two blocks. I need two coordinates to describe the position of those two objects. So now, the objects themselves, we will draw a block here and a block here. And then we'll identify the forces that act on those objects. So there's a spring, let's start with K1, right? There's a spring force acting on this object, and we'll just call that F1. There's a force acting between the objects from spring K2, and so that force will be F2. But of course, then that force acts with equal magnitude in opposite direction on block two. So we'll say that that is minus F2. Again, these have to be of equal magnitude in opposite direction. And then finally, we'll identify spring force three acting on block two. Examining these forces, we see that all forces are conservative. Each one is obtained from a spring and spring forces have potential energies. So these will be included in the potential energy. Remember when we derived Lagrange's equations we talked about three kinds of forces. Conservative forces that were again derived from a potential function constraint forces, which were used to enforce kinematic constraints and therefore did no work, and then other forces. Here, all these forces are derived from springs. So, the system is conservative. In particular, there are no non-conservative forces that act on these objects. And so now we look to identify coordinates and directions. Well, the directions we can use I and J, horizontal and vertical. And for the coordinates, let's first identify a coordinate that determines the configuration or the displacement of this block from the unstretched position. We'll call that X. We will define a second coordinate that does the same for block two. So we'll define that as Y. And then if I look at the springs, X is defined as the stretch in this spring. So it will serve as the coordinate for the potential energy. Y does the same for spring three, because now the stretch, or in this case, the compression of, s of spring three is exactly Y. But spring two 
is dependent on the relative displacement. So we'll actually define a coordinate z that is precisely the relative displacement of spring 2. So now, if I look at these coordinates, we have a 2 degree of freedom system and three coordinates. So there's a constraint equation. In particular, the displacement of block 2, which is y, is equal to the displacement of block 1, that's x, plus then the extra displacement between these two, or the relative displacement, which is z. So this serves as our constraint equation. Now, turning to the kinetic energy, the velocity of each object is given by either x in terms of v1, so that's x dot in the i direction, or for block 2, it's y dot in the i direction. And as a result, the kinetic energy is the kinetic energy of block 1 plus the kinetic energy of block 2, where T1 is M1 over 2 x dot squared, and T2 is M2 over 2 y dot squared. Here x dot is the magnitude of the velocity of block 1 squared, and y dot squared is the magnitude of v2 squared. Looking at the potential energy, the total potential is equal to the potential in spring 1 plus the potential in spring 2 plus the potential in spring 3. And, and so if I look at force 1, which gives rise to potential energy 1, that's V1 is equal to K1 over 2 times the stretch squared, so that's X squared. V2 here is K2 divided by 2, Z squared, and V3 is K3 divided by 2 times Y squared. So again, each of these forces gives rise to a potential energy function. And in addition, we have measured the kinetic energy in each object. The Lagrangian is just T minus V. And remember T is M1 over 2, x dot squared, m2 over 2, y dot squared, and v is just the sum of these three individual potential terms. So there they are again, I just wrote them out nicely. So here is the kinetic energy, and this is the potential energy, and the Lagrangian is the difference. However, if you notice, we have three coordinates in the Lagrangian as we've written it. To apply Lagrange's equations, all of the coordinates must be independent. So in this case, we can only have two independent coordinates present in the Lagrangian. So here, we can, we can really choose any one to get rid of. Remember our constraint equation was y is equal to x plus z. Right, so here, let's eliminate z by solving this constraint equation. So in terms of the remaining coordinates, which are x and y, the Lagrangian is, well, the kinetic energy is, is fine, right? It's already written in terms of x and y. Then the potential energy has a z term, so we'll just substitute z is equal to y 
minus x. And so now we have the Lagrangian written in terms of x and y alone. Well, now we're ready to apply Lagrange's equations. Let's remember what those are. Right, so Lagrange's equations in general look like the total derivative of the partial of L with respect to QI minus the partial of L, sorry this was QI dot, minus QI itself is equal to the generalized force. So here Q1 will choose as X and Q2 we'll choose as y. I could just as easily choose q1 as y and q2 as x, um, but since x comes before y, we'll start there. So now I have to take the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x, x dot, y, and y dot to apply Lagrange's equations. All right, so let's start off with the partial of L with respect to x dot. Remember when we take partial derivatives, we essentially hold all of the other variables fixed and then take the derivative with respect to that one. So in this case, we're taking the derivative with respect to x dot. So we hold y dot fixed, but also we hold x and y fixed as well. We treat x and x dot as different things here. So in doing so, this is the only term with an x dot. And so the partial of L with respect to x dot becomes m1 x dot. Let's do the partial of L with respect to y dot next. Same thing. All of these are held fixed. This is held fixed. And we end up with m2 times y dot. Now we need to take the partial of L with respect to x. So again, we're thinking of x and x dot as different things. So holding x dot, y dot, and y fixed, the partial of L with respect to x dot becomes negative from this negative here, and then the derivative of this with respect to x, which is k1 times x plus k2 times y minus x, and then of course we have to take the derivative of what's inside with respect to x, so that becomes minus 1 there. And finally, the partial of L with respect to Y, very similar, right? And we get K2, Y minus X. Here, the partial of what's inside with respect to Y is just 1, plus K3 times Y. So these are my partial derivatives that I need for Lagrange's equations. Here, I've written them again, just to kind of um, keep everything on the same page. Uh, a little nicer, but we can now find the equations of motion. In particular, the equation of motion for Q1 or for X is partial of the deriv total derivative of the partial of L with respect to X dot minus the partial of L with respect to X. In this case, this equals zero because all of our forces were conservative, right? So we have no generalized force. And in doing so, we essentially take the derivative of this with respect to time, right? So x dot, the derivative with respect to time becomes m1 x double dot, and then minus this term, right? So I conveniently put the minus sign over on the other side. So this ends up as k1 plus k2 times x here and here minus k2 times y is equal to zero. And when I do the same for y, we end up with m2 y double dot here I'll do the x term next, minus k2 times x plus k2 plus k3 times y is equal to zero. 
So these are the equations of motion for this chain of masses. Not quite done, though. I want to write these in matrix form. So with the vector x defined as x, y, this can be written in the following way. m1, 0, x double dot, y double dot. Notice that there's no y double dot term here in the first equation. So now the next piece we have is k1 plus k2 minus k2 times x and y equals 0. And then the second equation, we have 0 m2. We have a minus k2 times x plus k2 plus k3 times y is equal to 0. Or, again, kind of in matrix form, we have m x double dot plus k x equals 0, where this is the mass matrix. And notice that the mass matrix here is dynamically uncoupled or the system is dynamically uncoupled because the mass matrix is diagonal. And in addition, this is the stiffness matrix. And we see that the system is statically coupled because the stiffness matrix is not simply diagonal. I will point out, and this will be important later, that both the mass and the stiffness matrix are symmetric. So the off diagonal components are the same in the top right and the bottom left. In this case they're both 0, in this case they're both minus k2. We'll see that later when we start to talk about actually kind of solving these equations. So that's it. That's a nice example of a multi-degree of freedom system, conservative, where we have used Lagrange's equations to develop the equations of motion. Thanks a lot, and I will talk to you again. Bye. Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today <coughs> I'd like to have dogs that were not very loud when I start recording videos. <coughs>